The Ant and the Grasshopper. When I was a very small boy, I was made to learn by heart certain of the fables of La Fontaine, and the moral of each was carefully explained to me. Among those I learned was the Ant and the Grasshopper, which is devised to bring home to the young the useful lesson that in an imperfect world industry is rewarded and giddiness punished. In this admirable fable, the ant spends a laborious summer gathering its winter store. While the grasshopper sits on a blade of grass, singing to the sun, winter comes and the ant is comfortably provided for. But the grasshopper has an empty larder. He goes to the ant and begs for a little food. Then the ant gives him her classic answer: "What were you doing in the summer time? Saving your presents? I sang, I sang all day, all night. You sang. Why then, go and dance." I do not ascribe it to perversity on my part, but rather to the inconsequence of childhood, which is deficient in moral sense, that I could never quite reconcile myself to the lesson. My sympathies were with the grasshopper, and for some time I never saw an ant without putting my foot on it. I could not help thinking of this fable when the other day I saw George Ramsay lunching by himself in a restaurant. I never saw any one wear an expression of such deep gloom. He was staring into space. He looked as though the burden of the whole world sat on his shoulders. I was sorry for him. I suspected at once that his unfortunate brother had been causing trouble again. I went up to him and held out my hand. "How are you?" I asked. "I am not in hilarious spirits," he answered. "Is it Tom again?" He sighed. "Yes, it's Tom again." Why don't you chuck him? You've done everything in the world for him. You must know by now that he's quite hopeless. I suppose every family has a black sheep. Tom had been a sore trial to his for twenty years. He had begun life decently enough. He went into business, married, and had two children. The Ramses were perfectly respectable people, and there was every reason to suppose that Tom Ramsey would have a useful and honourable career. But one day, without warning. He announced that he didn't like work and that he wasn't suited for marriage. He wanted to enjoy himself. He would listen to no expostulations. He left his wife and his office. He had a little money and he spent two happy years in the various capitals of Europe. Rumours of his doings reached his relations from time to time, and they were profoundly shocked. He certainly had a very good time. They shook their heads and asked what would happen when his money was spent. They soon found out. He borrowed. He was charming and unscrupulous. I have never met anyone to whom it was more difficult to refuse a loan. He made a steady income from his friends, and he made friends easily. He always said that the money you spent on necessities was boring. The money that was amusing to spend was the money you spent on luxuries. For this, he depended on his brother George. He did not waste his charm on him. George was a serious man and insensible to such enticements. George was respectable. Once or twice he failed Tom's promises of amendment, and gave him considerable sums in order that he might make a fresh start. On these, Tom bought a motor car and some very nice jewellery. But when circumstances forced George to realise that his brother would never settle down, and he washed his hands of him, Tom, without a qualm. Began to blackmail him. It was not very nice for a respectable lawyer to find his brother shaking cocktails behind the bar of his favourite restaurant, or to see him waiting on the box seat of a taxi outside his club. Tom said that to serve in a bar or to drive a taxi was a perfectly decent occupation, but if George could oblige him with a couple of hundred pounds, he didn't mind for the honour of the family giving it up. George paid. Once Tom nearly went to prison. George was terribly upset. He went into the whole discreditable affair. Really, Tom had gone too far. He had been wild, thoughtless, and selfish, but he had never before done anything dishonest, by which George meant illegal. And if he were prosecuted, he would assuredly be convicted. But you cannot allow your only brother to go to jail. The man Tom had cheated, a man called Cronshaw, was vindictive. He was determined to take the matter into court. He said Tom was a scoundrel and should be punished. It cost George an infinite deal of trouble and five hundred pounds to settle the affair. I have never seen him in such a rage as when he heard that Tom and Cronshaw had gone off together to Monte Carlo the moment they cashed the cheque. 
they spent a happy month there. For twenty years, Tom raced and gambled, philandered with the prettiest girls, danced, ate in the most expensive restaurants, and dressed beautifully. He always looked as if he had just stepped out of a bandbox. Though he was forty-six, he would never have taken him for more than thirty-five. He was a most amusing companion, and though you knew he was perfectly worthless, you could not but enjoy his society. He had high spirits and unfailing gaiety, and incredible charm. I never grudged the contributions he regularly levied on me for the necessities of his existence. I never lent him fifty pounds without feeling that I was in his debt. Tom Ramsay knew everyone, and everyone knew Tom Ramsay. You could not approve of him, but you could not help liking him. Poor George, only a year older than his scapegrace brother, looked sixty. He had never taken more than a fortnight's holiday in the year for a quarter of a century. He was in his office every morning at nine thirty and never left it till six. He was honest, industrious, and worthy. He had a good wife to whom he had never been unfaithful even in thought, and four daughters to whom he was the best of fathers. He made a point of saving a third of his income, and his plan was to retire at fifty-five to a little house in the country, where he proposed to cultivate his garden and play golf. His life was blameless. He was glad that he was growing old. Because Tom was growing old too, he rubbed his hands and said, "It's all very well when Tom is young and good-looking, but he's only a year younger than I am. In four years, he'll be fifty. He won't find life so easy then. I shall have thirty thousand pounds by the time I'm fifty. For twenty-five years, I've said that Tom would end in the gutter, and we shall see how he likes that. We shall see if it really pays best to work or be idle." Poor George. I sympathised with him. I wondered now, as I sat down beside him, what infamous thing Tom had done. George was evidently very much upset. Do you know what's happened now? He asked me. I was prepared for the worst. I wondered if Tom had got himself into the hands of the police at last. George could hardly bring himself to speak. You're not going to deny that all my life I've been hardworking, decent, respectable, and straightforward. After a life of industry and thrift, I can look forward to retiring on a small income in gilt-edged securities. I've always done my duty in that state of life in which it has pleased providence to place me. True, and you can't deny that Tom has been an idle, worthless, dissolute, and dishonourable rogue. If there were any justice, he'd be in the workhouse. True. George grew red in the face. A few weeks ago. He became engaged to a woman old enough to be his mother, and now she's died and left him everything she had—half a million pounds, a yacht, a house in London, and a house in the country. George Ramsay beat his clenched fist on the table. It's not fair, I tell you. It's not fair. Damn it! It's not fair. I could not help it. I burst into a shout of laughter as I looked at George's wrathful face. I rolled in my chair. I very nearly fell on the floor. George never forgave me, but Tom often asks me to excellent dinners in his charming house in Mayfair, and if he occasionally borrows a trifle from me, that is merely from force of habit. It is never more than a sovereign. <laughs>